Okay, so we are um, hopefully going to think about chapter 23. So we're making some progress. Um, the goal is to get to 25. And then we can catch our breath and look back and see what we did till 25, because 26 to 34 is its own section. And then we're going to catch our breath once we get to 35. We're still on the marathon now of these chapters 18 to 24, 25. So I just want to do two two minute, you know, sort of ca a catch up to where we are right now within the smaller picture. We're not going to talk about the big picture right now. But within the smaller picture, we began at chapter 20. And we said, look, chapter 20 said the commandments, the first two commandments, I'm the Lord your God, and do not serve idols, is essentially the entire Torah. Because all the positive commandments are included in I'm the Lord your God. And all the negative commandments are included in don't, do, in don't serve idols. In other words, that's 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 not the that's not Rabbi Shneir Zalman. That's the that's the that's the sages teach that. So in other in other words, every every sin is uh, basically idol worship, and we discussed that last week in some sense. So what are we really saying? So what what's the Hasidic in, in, in insight here? Hasidic insight is that the first commandment, believe in God, is not only the idea that the belief that believe in God but it's much more profound. It's accepting the oneness of God. And oneness of God means that God is one and everything else is insignificant. That's what the mitzvah is. So if God's will is important, but my will is important too, I'm not fully in, 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 attuned to the oneness of God because the oneness of God means God is one, but there's no second because the second is insignificant as we discussed at great length at chapter 20. And the converse we discussed last week in chapter 22, that in some sense, unholiness, any unholiness, anything that doesn't submit to God, in a sense is idol worship because idol worship means not that I'm denying God. Certainly the early idol worshipers were not atheists. They did not deny God. They just said that in addition to God, there are other forces that God creates and gives power to. So if God tells me, um, if, this, if I accept that there's God, but within my house, I'm in charge, then I'm a small God. He's bigger than me, but I'm also God. I'm also powerful, right? So that is, that is idol worship because I'm denying, not denying God, but denying the oneness of God. And that was very hard to understand because we don't want to be idol worshipers. Like we know, we said that Tanya chapter 18, no Jew wants to be an idol worshiper. We're not saying idol worshiper in the, in the simple sense, but we're saying essentially belief in God would be accepting the oneness and, and, and the opposite of belief in God would be denying the oneness. One way to deny the oneness is asserting another existence. That's denying the oneness. So that's what we did last week. We don't want to go into that because that's a little harsh. We'll get back to it next week. Now we're elaborating, chapter 23 elaborates on the oneness of God. And it's going to go into some detail to explain how when we study the Torah and we perform the commandments, we're actually uniting with the oneness of God. So it's not just belief. It's not just I believe in the oneness of God, but I actually experience the oneness of God when I study the Torah and when I fulfill the commandments. That's, in short, the theme of today. So if you have to go for right now, you got the theme. Every time I study Torah, every time I do a mitzvah, I'm connecting to the oneness of God. Now we have a whole chapter. It's actually a pretty long chapter because it talks about the mechanism of how this happens. And it gets specific. There's a difference between Torah and the commandments. There's a difference between different parts of me, how different parts of me merge with this oneness. And there are different metaphors used because we have different elements within myself. And the way they merge with the oneness is distinct based on, 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 on whatever issue we're talking about, the energy, the godly soul, the animal soul. So we have a whole spectrum of parts of the self that become that merge with the oneness, and therefore there's different metaphors because different metaphors fit for the different um, for the different uh, things we're talking about. But that's that's the gen that's generally what we're trying to get at. What we're trying to get at is that when I do the mitzvah, I fulfill, I, I study Torah, I fulfill the mitzvah. What is the Torah? What is a mitzvah? It's the will of God. So when part when I become fulfill the mitzvah i'm okay I'm, I'll, I'll tell you the metaphors here's two metaphors one metaphor starts with the zohar the zohar says that the mitzvah is a varim de malka aramaic for the limbs of the king what does it mean it means every mitzvah is of god 
God has no body. So what do we mean? So that's what we have to explain. So just, just for the parenthetically, we know that there's 248 positive commandments. Uh, the sages say there's 248 positive commandments corresponding to the limbs of the human body. Now, I have no idea how, how many limbs a human body has in how modern science classifies it, but it's all classification. The sages classification is 248 positive commandments, there's 248 limbs. Each limb is a mitzvah. So the Zohar, that's what the Talmud says. So the Zohar takes us a little further. I believe it's the Talmud, but it's written certainly in the revealed part of the Torah. The Zohar takes us a little further. The Zohar says that the mitzvah is the limb of the king, limb of God. What does that, what does that mean? So when you look at a body and a soul, the body has no will of itself. When I decide I want to move my finger, I don't have to take a debate. I don't have to send a message, send an email, and say, please, could you move your finger? And then the, and then the, and the body would say, well, I'm not in the mood. right? If you want to move your finger and your finger doesn't move, you should check yourself into the emergency room because it's probably a stroke. right? But on a good day, there's no debate. The body has no will of its own. It's no entity of its own. All it is is an ex a vehicle for the soul. That is a tremendous amount of unity between body and soul where the body has no will of its own. And as soon as the soul wants to move, the consciousness wants to move, the body moves. We're going to say that's the metaphor for a mitzvah. The mitzvah is the will of God in this world. What does God want? So just like the body is the vehicle for the soul's will, every mitzvah is the vehicle for the divine will. Vehicle is the wrong word because we're going to see that you see vehicle is another is another metaphor, but I would say a vessel, a conduit. Okay, so that's the mitzvah itself. But God, the mitzvah itself, God wants us to put on tefillin. God wants us to light Shabbos candles. God wants to eat matzah on Passover. That is the limb of the king. What is a limb? A limb is brings my energy of my soul to expression because my energy of the soul is abstract to allow to move to to accomplish something in this world. I need a limb. But the limb has no identity of its own in the sense that it has no will of its own. It's totally nullified to the will of the soul. That's the mitzvah. Now there's another metaphor we're going to offer in this, in this, in this chapter. We're going to get into the details as we go through the chapter, but I'm speaking very general still. The next metaphor we use in this chapter is the metaphor of a chariot and a rider. So I have a, a, the person riding and the actual wagon or your car and you. That's also considered a great, a great, a, not as great as the unity of body and soul, which is instantaneous. The second the soul wants to move, the body uh, follows. The, and the body and the soul are united. It's not like there's a soul and a body. The body itself becomes alive because of the soul. But then there's me and my, and my chariot. And the chariot doesn't have a will of its own, takes me where I need to go. But nevertheless, it's not that same level of unity. Um, because it's not one with me, something that I use. So when a person does a mitzvah, his body becomes like a chariot to divine will. And a chariot, a wagon, is the metaphor for something. It's not one, like the body and soul, which become one, but it has no will of its own. It's just a conduit, like a, like a, like a chariot. And that's the unity that we get with God through studying, to do performing a mitzvah. And that's why the sages say, the sages say in the Talmud, Ha'avot, the patriarchs, Heim Heim Hamerkava, they are the chariots. What do we mean? We mean if you open up the book of Ezekiel on chapter one, which we're going to read on the Haftorah of Shavuos, which is exactly one week from Sunday, we read about the vision of Ezekiel, where Ezekiel sees all kinds of angels, and there's a chariot, considered the chariot of God. So apparently the chariot of God is the sort of the, 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 the vehicle for God to accomplish things in this world, which are the angels. But in any case, say, say just say, you know, who's the chariot of God in this world? It's the patriarchs. Because the patriarchs were chariots. Why were they chariots? Because they had no will of their own. They're, all they wanted to do was fulfill God's will. So they're a chariot. Now, we are not like the patriarchs because the patriarchs were like this all day long. We are like the patriarchs when we do a mitzvah. When we, act, when, when we act as a chariot, then even though I'd rather be doing something else, I'd rather be playing golf, but if I'm going to go do a mitzvah, at this moment, my physical body is carrying out the will of God. It is nullified to God. That, like the chariot is nullified 
to the writer. So again, we have two metaphors. We have the mitzvah of the of the we have, we have the metaphor of the body and soul that unity that the body has no independent ex- will and desire. That's the mitzvah itself. And then we have the human pr- being doing the mitzvah. When I do the mitzvah, I'm affirming God's oneness because I'm saying I have no will of my own. I'm a chariot. What am I doing now? Putting on tefillin. I'm eating matzah. I'm sitting in the sukkah. It's not me. It is the will of God. Um, I'm, I'm acting through me. I'm just, just a chariot. And when we go through the chapter, you'll see that that's the body and the animal soul. But then if you go higher within the godly soul, the godly soul's unity is much deeper. I don't want to get into that right now. But that's what we're going to say. Just one more point to the uh, g- general introduction, then we'll take questions, and then we'll read it inside. Study Torah, however, we're going to say is a much deeper unity. It's actually interesting. So when God tells me to honor my parents, and I go and I make my mother a tea, I'm a chariot. But when I study, think about, and, or verbalize the commandment to honor my parents, then the unity is much greater. How, how, how so? How come? Well, you have to come along with the journey, and we have to read the chapter. So there's a lot of points here. It's a relatively long chapter, subtle points. So we have, so it's gonna, we have to hopefully we'll explain and, and digest and internalize. But in general, that's what we're doing in 23. What we're trying to say is that every mitzvah, going back to, to the point that we started on chapter 20, chapter 20 says that every mitzvah, all the mitzvahs are included in the first mitzvah. And then we explained how the first mitzvah is the unity, is the, is the, is the oneness of God. Every mitzvah is an affirmation of the oneness of God. The way we explain oneness of God means that there's no other, anything significant other than God. Every time I do a mitzvah, I'm affirming that. I'm becoming a vehicle to that truth. And certainly when I study Torah, it's even a greater unity. And the conclusion of the chapter is that's why when we study Torah, that's why Torah, is, Torah study is actually a vehicle to get a, a tremendous sense of awe of God. Because if I have the proper meditation, I can realize this, that I'm a chariot to the essence of God. As Rabbi Shneir Zaman will explain, he'll say it better than me. So let's wait for him. Go ahead, Vicky. Well, thank you, Rabbi, for taking a question because I don't want to be in suspense till the very end. I, I want to. <laughs> I would like to know if anywhere in this chapter or in Tanya, uh, it, it's explained that um, there are there are so many mitzvot. So we honestly cannot know. I mean, the re- regular person, the Binyan, he cannot know all the mitzvot and it's not all we're doing we, we are not 24 7 like putting into fill and and, right. and eating matzo. so in our day-to-day decision how do we know what god wants to to be maybe we honestly thinking that we're connecting to god but we are not oh so so then we have to go back to the i think we have to go back to that chapter seven chapter seven describes that so you're right we're not doing okay let me start from the beginning you're right we're not doing mitzvot all day and that's why all day, we don't, we don't, it, not every act of a day is an affirmation of the oneness of God, the way a mitzvah is. Because again, the premise is every time we do a mitzvah, we're connecting to the oneness of God. Oneness of God means God is one, nothing else is significant whatsoever. That level of unity with the oneness, I only have when I do a mitzvah. What happens when I don't do a mitzvah? I'm going to work, okay? Here, now I get into territory of, ch- of chapter seven. Now I get into the territory of Klipat Noga. It's Klipa. It's not holiness. I sense myself. I sense my, my, my career. I sense what I'm trying to achieve. But it's the Klipa of light. It could be elevated. If I'm doing this for the sake of later connecting to the unity of God, then all that energy that invested in that occupation or in that eating or in that whatever I'm doing, taking care of the body, all that is elevated. So there is a distinction between... between um, the moment when I'm doing a mitzvah and the moment when I'm doing neutral things, but it's for the sake of the mitzvah. So I think what you're describing is how do I know what God wants of me in this moment? That's in this territory of klipat noga, neutral, what really is no neutral, what we would call think of neutral, but really is not holiness, but it has the ability to be elevated to holiness. There there's ambiguity in many cases. But when it comes to the commandments, Right now, it's the night of Passover. God says, eat the matzah. There's no ambiguity, okay? When I eat the matzah, I, certain parts of me, we'll get, we'll get into the details, but at least at a minimum, my body is a chariot. I don't, I, my, the, the rider wants me to go somewhere, I'm going there. And the chariot doesn't have its own will, unless you have a car 
If you have a car that has its own wheel, you're in trouble. It just happened to me. I had to give the shop in because the wheel starts turning instead of when, when you don't turn it. My wife came home. She said, the wheel turned. I didn't turn the wheel. I said, okay, we got it. We have a problem because it, it didn't reach the bittle. It didn't reach the humility and the nullification required in chapter 23. So it's not a good chariot. So we have to upgrade it. The point here is when I do the mitzvah, I get that unity of affirmation, affirmation of the divine, of not only divine, not only belief in God in the sense that God believes, but affirming the one oneness of God. Oneness of God means God's will matters, mine doesn't in this moment. 10 minutes from now, I matter because now I'm out of the realm of holiness and the realm of, of, of chapter seven, which is not sin, but klipa, unholiness that could be elevated. And here, I don't have that same unity, but as you, as you described then, as we read in chapter seven, when I'll do a mitzvah, after I go to work, after I eat breakfast, after I work out, after I take care of my knees, after I go on vacation, I come back and I do a mitzvah. Now what is elevated, what becomes part of the chariot is not just the moment and the energy of this mitzvah, but all the energy invested in the enabling of this moment. That theme we're going to get back to later also in chapter 30, 30, 30, uh, 35 and on. We talk about the, 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 super, the superiority of action. Again, every mitzvah elevates. So he talks about that notion that it's not just a moment of the mitzvah, but it's everything that leads up to it. But 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 still, it's not in that same level of of uh, unity of the chariot. Because when I go to work, I have my own. I feel myself. I have my own will and my own needs, which is okay, which is fine. We're human, right? God wants us. If He wanted us to not have our own ego, we would we would create us without our own ego, right? The whole idea here is that a creation, which from our perspective seems to be uh, ha have our own existence. We should affirm the truth. And what is the truth? The truth is that everything in the universe is just an expression of God, God's energy. And as we discussed the great length in chapter 20 and 21, we're just one letter. We're one, we're one letter compared to the essence of God, like one letter compared to the essence of the person. It's completely insignificant. Right? Now, if you want to think about it, you want a metaphor, physical metaphor, people want to know why did God create the universe to be so massive? Uh, who cares that there's stars, who knows how many oh, galaxies, who many light years, light years away. If, if, if we, the purpose of creation is for the human being, which we believe it is, so, so why are we so small? One of the, one of the uh, physicists asked the question, who, what did he ask? Oh, someone wrote a book about this. Uh, Herman Walker wrote a book, book about this. He said, very interesting. Oh, this is very interesting. I, I, I'm just remembering from a very long time ago, so I don't remember. But he said like this. He says he can't believe that the human being is significant. Why? He said... If you're making a play and the human being is the play, why is the stage so large? It makes no sense to have a stage that's the size of this universe because there's one little speck of dust here where the people are running around trying to make moral choice, right? He said that was the metaphor. He says, the stage is too big. So when I heard that as a, as a, a years ago, I said, this is, this is actually absolutely fascinating. And what's fascinating is because the stage is not too small. The entire stage, everything God created was for his glory, as the ethics of the Father says. God wants to have a physical metaphor to show us how the truth that we are completely insignificant to God. Not only are we insignificant to God, we're insignificant to the universe, to the creation. Forget about to the creator, right? So I think it's possible that, that, that if the science was out there when the Tanya was written, perhaps that would be the metaphor. Right. In other words, to understand the insignificance of this entire uh, this entire planet, not to God, forget about God, to this un to, to our galaxy, certainly to the universe. We're, we're we're not even a speck of dust. That's to the creation. Forget about the creator. Right. So for us to have that appreciation, that's what God wants. Now, when do we actually unite with that with that with that with that truth? When we do a mitzvah, and even more so when we study Torah. So we're going to get into this whole thing. So at the end of this chapter, you're going to see that the unity through Torah is even greater than the unity through a mitzvah. So in other words, studying about the concept is more important than, the con than doing the concept itself in some sense. But don't worry. When you read later in the Tanya, chapter 35 and on, it will tell you the other side of the coin, which is even though the unity, the holiness that is achieved through study of Torah is greater, but for the purpose of creation, action is greater. And that's why Judaism emphasizes action. So it's a, it's a big book. It's a big book. It's 53 chapters. We're only on, 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 uh, on, on round one, or halfway through round one. We're going to have other rounds. So the point here, as I'm trying to say, it's a lot to, to internalize. But when we make a statement and we say Torah is, is, is greater because the unity with God is greater, 
That's true, but we may also highlight later a different point, that for the purpose of creation, action is greater. And they're both true, and we're going to reconcile this. So this is where we're headed. Um, this is where we have to do. I'm, I'm, uh, there's a lot going on in this chapter. It's not too short, but I think, I think this is the, these are the big ideas, I think. Thank you. What chapter did they give me? 21. No, we need chapter 23. Huh? Oh, that's chapter 22. Okay, we'll read. We'll see what happens. In light of all the above, in other words, talking about the unity of God and how God is, every mitzvah is an affirmation of the unity of God, the unity of God meaning. God's one and, not, and nothing else is significant. So in light of all the above, uh, 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 in light of all, of all that has been said above, we can better understand and more fully and clearly elucidate the statement of the Zohar, that Torah and God are entirely one. We're going to talk about that. Where do you sense the unity of God? In the Torah. And the commentary in the Tikkun Zohar, that the 248 commandments are the 248 organs of a divine king. What does that mean? So what's this metaphor of a mitzvah being like an organ of the body, a limb of the body? For the mitzvot constitute God's innermost will and his true desire, which is clothed in all the upper and lower worlds, thereby giving them life. The very life and sustenance of all the worlds is dependent upon the performance of mitzvot by the, cre by the creatures of the lowest world, as is known. Okay. It, it follows that the performance and fulfillment of the mitzvot is the innermost garment for the innermost aspects of God's will. Since it is due to this performance of the mitzvot that the light and life of the worlds issue forth from the divine will to be clothed in them. What are we saying here? What we're saying is we're an elaboration from last week. We said there's two levels of will. Everything you do, you do is either the inner will or the external will. Inner will is you want something for its own sake. External will, you want it to achieve another goal. So I want to catch the train so I can get to work. That's external will. I want to work. That's external will. I want money, even that. So it's deeper, but it's external will. Because I, ultimately, it's what do, I, what do I want? What am I going to do with the money? What do I really want? So we know why God created the world. God created the world because of his will. But what's his will? So he wants holiness. He wants Torah. That's the innermost will. That's the goal. The fact that he creates a world with concealment, with evil, that is only to facilitate the deeper will, to allow for the free choice, to allow for a place where people can keep the Torah in a significant and meaningful way. So all the world is the external will. Now, if the external will, nobody engages in external will if it doesn't lead them to internal will, right? If you ride the train, you get to your destination, but your destination, the goal is not, you, you don't achieve your destination, you're not going to go back the next day. So what we're saying here is that the entire energy of the entire universe, which is the external will, is dependent on the internal will. What's the internal will? That the Jew will perform the Torah. So the Torah and the mitzvah is actually the vehicle for the energy for the entire world. That's the mystical truth about the energy of the world, that it's dependent on the Jew performing the Torah and the mitzvot. Now we say, hence, the mitzvot are, are figurative, figuratively described as organs of the king, for just as the organs of the human body are a garment for its soul, and are completely and utterly surrendered to it, right? The organs of the body, hopefully, if you're healthy, your body has no will of its own. It surrenders completely to the soul, as, as is evident from the fact that as soon as a person desires to stretch out his hand or foot, they obey his will immediately, right? The body doesn't start negotiating with you without any command or instruction to them and with no delay whatsoever. But the very instant that, the, that, it, that it entered his will to do so. So that's what an organ is. An organ is a metaphor. Our organ is something that has no will of its own. The moment the soul wants that wants to wants to act, the organ does so. That's the metaphor we're looking for. Now that's exact. That's the metaphor we're saying is the metaphor to describe the Torah, the mitzvah. In other words, the will of God. Just as the organs of the human body are completely united with one soul and are surrendered to it, so too is the life force animating the performance and fulfillment of the commandments completely surrendered to the divine will which is clothed therein 
And this life force becomes in relation to the divine will, like a body to a soul. So in other words, the mitzvah, the life that's in the mitzvah, the mitzvah, the, the mitzvah, God tells us to do something. So this action is just completely nullified to the, to, to, to the will of God. So that's one point. Now we're going to say not only the mitzvah is nullified to God, but also the, par the parts of the human soul invested in the mitzvah. What, which part of the human soul is invested in the mitzvah? So if you're doing a mitzvah, you presume it's the godly soul. But the godly soul has three garments, thought, speech, and action. You're doing a mitzvah. So let's focus on the external, the third garment, the garment of action of the godly soul. What happens to the garment of the, of the godly soul? The action, the power of action of the godly soul when I perform a mitzvah. Likewise, the external garment of the divine soul of a person fulfilling and practicing the commandments, i.e. its faculty of action, I'm skipping to the next paragraph, clothes itself in the vitality of the performance of the mitzvah, and thus it too becomes like a body to the soul in relation to the divine will, and is completely surrendered to the i.e. the soul's power of action becomes united with the divine will in the same way as one's body is united with his soul. Okay, so what happens here? What happens is the mitzvah itself, the energy of the mitzvah, is like a soul, like, 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 a, like, a, like a limb compared to the soul. It's completely surrendered. My faculty of action, the power of my godly soul to, to perform action is also united with the mitzvah completely like a body to a soul. And now we're going to say, how does that affect the physical body? In this way, in this way those organs of the human body which perform the mitzvah, i.e. those organs in which the divine soul's faculty of action is clothed during the performance and fulfillment of the mitzvah. They too become a, a vertebral vehicle, literally a merkava, a chariot for the divine will. So this is a distinction already, right? My body is physical. My body has its own will. Um, in other words, it's not nullified to, the, to God in the same sense. So my body, we don't, when you talk about the godly soul, you say, yeah, the godly soul, the power of action of the godly soul is like a body to a soul. It's totally surrendered. The physical body, my physical body during the mitzvah, my hand which distributes charity is not like a body to a soul, but it's like a chariot. So it's a, it's a lesser degree of surrender, but it's still surrender. For example, the hand which distributes charity to the poor performs another commandment, becomes in the act of performing the mitzvah a chariot to the divine will. Similarly, the feet which walk to the purpose of fulfilling a mitzvah, or the mouth and tongue which speak words of Torah, or the brain reflecting on the Torah, or on the fear of heaven, or on the greatness of God, blessed be he. All these are mitzvot, not just to do a mitzvah with your hand, but also with your mind, with your brain, to be cognizant, to think about the greatness of God and, 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 the, great, and, and, and the Torah. And so that, all that, the physical aspects of my body, the physical limbs that I'm using, be it my hand, be it my physical brain, they become a chariot. This is what the sages meant when they said, the patriarchs are, the, are, the divine, are, the, are truly the divine chariots. What does it mean? Why the patriarchs of the divine char chariots? For all their organs were completely holy and detached from mundane matters. And throughout their lives, they served as a vehicle for nothing but the divine will. So I'm not on the level of patriarchs because after I stop studying Torah, doing a mitzvah, I have my own will. And sometimes I have to fight and surrender my will for the will of God. The patriarchs are people who are chariots all the time. Now, it doesn't mean, I don't think it means, it doesn't mean they don't make mistakes. You know, the patriarch could make mistakes. But the point is, that, 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 that themselves, they are a chariot. They have their own will. They know, know their, know, not, none of their own will. What they want is they want to be a vehicle to express the Hashem's will. Okay, so that is the first step. If you see in the Tanya, we never have this, but there are two dots, which represent sort of the end of the points. If you open up a text of a Tanya, there's no vowels, no paragraph breaks. It's just words and words and words. Very, very rarely is there a stop in the middle of a chapter. This is a stop in the middle of the chapter. What do we discuss so far? We discussed, what do we discuss this far? so far? We discussed the unity that you get with, um, we discussed the mitzvah, the mitzvah itself. The energy of this mitzvah is like a limb to the soul. My godly soul, the parts of my godly soul invested in this mitzvah, which is the power of action of my godly soul is also like a limb, like a body and a soul, which is a complete and utter surrender and unity. So that's for that. Then we have the physical body. Physical body 
the hands that does the charity, the brain that contemplates the Torah. The, those, the physical part of me is also surrenders to the oneness of God, but the surrender is not as absolute. It's not like two entities that become one. It's two entities that remain two, but one is surrendered to the other. What's the metaphor? The chariot. The chariot is not the rider. It doesn't become one, like the body and the soul become one. But the chariot, has its, it's, its own, it's a separate entity, but has no will of its own. It surrenders its will completely to the rider. That's what happens to my physical body. Okay, when I do the mitzvah. So we have a stop here because we're stopping talking about the mitzvah. We're shifting from the mitzvah to what happens internally and externally in this to, my, to myself, to my personality when I study Torah. And what we're going to get at in some ways, when I study Torah, because the Torah is a, it actually uses more spiritual parts of myself. It uses my faculty of speech, which is higher than the faculty of action. And it also cer certainly uses my faculty of thinking, which is more spiritual. So that could be united with, the, with, with God's will in a much deeper way, as he will explain. So we're going to talk about, so, so in other words, the unity and the surrender that you get when studying Torah is even greater than you get when you, when you study the mitzvah, when you perform a mitzvah. Because when I perform a mitzvah, I'm just a chariot. At least the physical body is just a chariot. When I study Torah, we're going to see it's deeper than that. Okay, so that's, we'll take a, that's just a break so we can catch our breath. If anybody wants to comment, please do. Otherwise, we continue and we shift to the process of what happens of the unity of the affirmation and the uh, surrendering to God's unity that happens when one studies Torah. But the thought and meditation on the words of Torah. So we're not talking about doing a mitzvah, which is go uh, um, do something action-based. What happens to the thought when I of, of, of studying Torah, which is accomplished in the brain and the power of speech engaged in the words of Torah, which is in the mouth, these being the innermost garments of the divine soul, right? So we're talking about not, not the action, which is the most external garment, but it's the inner garments, more spiritual garments, the power to speak and the power to think. And surely the divine soul itself, which is clothed in them, i.e. in the thought, speech, engaged in Torah study. When I study Torah, I'm using my thoughts. But my soul is invested in my power to think. So the godly soul and the power to think and speak of the godly soul, all of them are fused in perfect unity with the divine will and are not merely, merely a vehicle, a chariot for it, as are the mouth and brain in which the thought and speech of Torah study take place. In other words, the physical body, the mouth and the brain are only like a chariot, but the power to think, the spiritual power to think, and the spiritual power to speak, in other words, the energy of the speech, that is much deeper. They are actually completely um, um, united with God. Why so? For the divine will is identical with the halachic subject of which one thinks and speaks, inasmuch as all the laws of the halacha are particular expressions of the innermost divine will itself. For God's will, will did thus, that a particular thing be deemed permissible or kosher, or that this person be found exempt or another innocent or the reverse. Similarly, all the letters, all the letter combinations of the Pentateuch, Pentateuch, the five books of Moses, prophets and writings, are also expressions of God's will and wisdom which are united with the, with the blessed Ein Sof in perfect unity, since he is the knower and the knowledge and the subject known. Okay, what are we saying here? Let me just read one, one more paragraph. This is what is meant by the statement that the Torah and God are absolutely one. They are not merely organs of the king as are the mitzvot. So this is a very important paragraph because that was the opening paragraph. We opened up a paragraph and we said, we quoted two things from the Zohar. Number one, we said, Torah and God are absolutely one. Then we said the mitzvot are limbs of the king. So which one is greater? Is absolutely one greater or is limbs of the king greater? So absolutely one is greater. So when I do the mitzvah, Certain parts of my soul are like the are, are like the body, are like the body and soul. The unity of the body to the soul. My physical body is like a chariot. 
But when I study Torah, it's not even body and soul. We're absolutely, a Torah is absolutely one with me and with God. So it's not two entities. It's not even body and soul becoming one. There is only one entity. And we explained it. We read it. We, we, Rabbi Shneur Zalman said, said what he wants to say. So I'm going to try to explain. God wants me to do something. God wants me to honor my parents. I make my mother a tea. But the tea that I make my mother is not God's will. It's an expression of God's will. In other words, the actual physical object is not God's will. It's the manifestation of God's will. But if I think about God's will, I'm uniting with God's will itself. The idea is God's will. The mitzvah is the manifestation of God's will. But it's not one with God. It's what God wants, but it's not one with God. But with my power of thought, if I grasp what God wants, then I become one with what God, with what God himself, with, with God's will, not the manifestation of God's will. So in other words, when I'm making the tea for my, for my mother, that tea is the limb of the king. That tea is the vehicle through which the divine will will come into the world. But it's not the divine will itself. But the idea of honoring your parents, that is exactly God's will. So when I understand it, I'm completely united with God's will. So it's a little counterintuitive. The will for the mitzvah is actually more powerful than the mitzvah itself if you want to talk about the unity. So let's see if he explains it, because I see the, 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 the shaded box explains it a little bit. Let's see. The difference between the two levels of unity with God achieved through Torah and mitzvah, respectively, may be clarified by the following analogy. A king orders his servants to build a palace for him and draws up a detailed blueprint for it. When they carry out his wishes, they are united with his desire as expressed in the palace. However, the palace walls themselves do not represent the king's will and wisdom, but the blueprint does. And the architects who study it are actually involved in the study of the king's will and wisdom. So too in our case. The actual performance of the mitzvot, although dictated by God's will, does not actually constitute this will. Not so the wisdom of the Torah, which is itself God's wisdom. And the halachic rulings are actually expressions of his will. And thus, when one speaks of things, words of Torah, he attains the greatest possible level of, un of union with God, who is one with his will and wisdom. Okay, do I understand this fully? I can't say I do. But again, just to reiterate. So God wants to build a palace. When I understand the blueprint, I'm united completely with what he wants. When the contractor built the wall and I hug the wall, the wall is consistent with God's will, but the wall is not God's will. The wall is a wall. The wall is not will. The wall is a vehicle for the will. But the abstract idea, that's his will. And when I understand it in my mind, I become one with that, with that, with that, with that will. So we're getting detailed here. But if you want to generalize, we're basically saying there's three levels of unity. The Torah itself is like the Zohar says, Torah and God are one. And we elaborated upon, upon in chapter five, when I understand the Torah, I am fused with the Torah in my mind. And that's the deepest unity possible. He said that in, in chapter five, one of the most powerful lines of Tanya, that there's no other unity as the unity of a, of a mind grasping an idea. So the Torah and God are one. When I study Torah, I join that oneness. Not body and soul. Body and soul are two things that become one. Torah and God, when I study Torah, and the Torah and God is completely one. Then you have when I do a mitzvah. When I do a mitzvah, so the spiritual parts, the more spiritual, the, 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 my godly soul, and the power of action of my godly soul, which have no other will other than to do the mitzvah, they're like the, they're like the, the union of the body and the soul, with the two entities that become one. The body that engages in Torah study, that engages in the action, in the mitzvah, by the way, also Torah study, the, the, the physical brain, that is a lesser level of unity. That's the unity of a chariot. So whichever metaphor you want, depending on what you're doing and what you're referring to, the bottom line is every mitzvah and every moment of Torah study, I am affirming the oneness of God. And the oneness of God as explained by in the Hasidic philosophy, which means oneness of God means there's nothing else other than God. But what am I? I'm nothing, I'm a chariot. Yeah, but you take up space. Yeah, but our chariot can't be said to have its own will. So I'm just a chariot. A chariot is an expression of the rider. Now, if you're on a higher level, if you, in other words, if, you, if, you, if, you're, if you're the godly soul feels when, when I do a mitzvah, not even a chariot and a rider, because the godly soul doesn't feel itself. So the godly soul is like, no, I'm just a body to a soul. 
I'm a body to a soul. I'm not, I'm not my own thing. I'm just a body to a soul. The unity is much deeper. And then if I'm studying Torah, it's not even me. I'm, 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 my mind grasps God's will. There's only God's will. There's nothing else. What is there other than God's will? And when I study Torah, what to do? Two people come into court holding a garment. Each one says it's mine. It's not about the garment. It's not about the $50. Who's going to get the $50? That's not why we sit up all night studying Torah to figure out what to do with the, 50, with, the, with, the, with, the, with, the with the dollar. What we're trying to do and what we're doing is when we grasp God's will, this is God's will. This is God's will. He wants that in this scenario, this should be the, this should be the, 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 the result. And when we reunite to that with that, we're united with that completely. Not even body, soul. So, and even, more than, even more than chariot rider and even more than body and soul. So that's the big idea. Later, we're going to talk about Rabbi Shneir Zaman is going to say that when you study Torah, you should understand this awareness and be aware of um, this great level of connection to God, that this awesome level of connection to God that takes place and, that, and that's available in the study of Torah. And therefore, it brings it, the Torah study is a vehicle, pun intended, because we're talking about vehicles, a vehicle to get a greater level of awe. But we'll get to that if we have time. I think we will. Go ahead, Vicky. Well, I think we concluded. That's why I want. So I, I wanted to make sure that I understand how this answers the question that I had at the beginning. Um, I think the uh, the metaphor with the palace when you're hugging the wall and you're not feeling it. It's uh, it's um, it's helping in a way that when you study Torah, you can not only be able to build this this particular palace but other palaces as well so when you when you go when you go study when you study torah then will enable you like your better decision making in the regular life right okay that's true that's a benefit of studying torah but but we're talking about with the unity that's not the point of the unity the unity we're saying is i want to become one with god so i know god has an idea to build a house so he built a house so i'm going to hug his house it's nice. I'm hold, I'm hugging a V. I'm holding. I'm hugging something that's 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 a that's a, that's a that's a expression of his will. But I'm not hugging him. I'm not hugging his will. In my mind, if I understand what he wants, my mind is hugging his will. So again, we're not saying that you want to live in the world of ideas and building the palace is not important. If you're the king, you want to live in the palace. That's what we're going to say when it comes to practicality. In some sense, the midst, the, it's more important to build a palace than to understand. Right? If I say, do me a favor, could you go buy me a coffee? So you say, I really understand why you want it, but I'm actually not going to the store. So have a nice day. Someone else says, I'm going to go buy you a coffee. I don't understand why you want it. Right. So obviously, will I want the will to happen in the real world? That's what God wants. So in some ways, what's more important is more important to build the palace for the king. Go put on your tefillin, go eat your matzah, go sit in the sukkah, etc. But if you want to talk about not what God wants and what the purpose of this, you want, where do I hug? Where do I become one? Where is the unity? So I'm either hugging the wall or my mind is hugging the will itself. So we're talking now, chapter 23, we want to know, we're, we're analyzing the levels of, 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 of unity that I can get with the divine, with Hashem, and get to the point where, where of, of being an affirmation of the, the, the unity of God, which means not only that God exists, but nothing else exists. So what about me? Okay, so when I do a mitzvah, or I study Torah, I lose my own identity. To what degree do I lose my identity? Well, that depends. It depends which part of me. Is it my body? Is it the faculties of my godly soul? Or is it my mind itself? And it also depends what I'm engaged in. Am I engaged in Torah or a mitzvah? If I'm engaged in a mitzvah, the most I can get to is being like a body and a soul, two things that unite. Or my body itself, when my body itself engages the mitzvah, it's a chariot. When you're talking about Torah, your physical brain is a chariot. Your mouth is a chariot. But the spiritual capacity to understand is completely one with the idea. It's not two things that unite. You, you're, you're nothing. What are you? You just understand that God's will is that when two people are fighting about the garment, split the garments. Where, where are you here? You're not here. Right? My physical, my physical brain is here. So my physical brain is a chariot. But my spiritual power to think understands nothing else other than the divine will. It's completely one. It's not two things that become one. It loses itself entirely. So that's what we're trying to get at. We're not trying to get at what's the ultimate value of the world. Oh, for that, action is more important. So when you study Torah, there are many side benefits. You'll also know how to build palaces, and you build one palace and many palaces. It's wonderful. You've got many, many, many benefits. But that's not what we're, what we're focusing on now. In this, in, in this chapter, 
We wanted to, and, and next week we're gonna, we're gonna do the opposite, the negative, that every mitzvah is an assertion of my own will, is an assertion of an identity other than God. That's idol worship. You see, the problem is all the people that were here last week and didn't come this week, they only got the negative, they didn't get the positive. Now, if they come back next week, they're gonna get more negative. Oi, you have to watch this video, right? This video tells you every time you do a mitzvah, Every time you study Torah, it could be 60 seconds. You open up what you open up Chabad.org, you read one idea of Torah. What's happening now? You're either a chariot, or parts of you are a chariot, parts of you are, are limbs of the king, limbs of God, and part of you is one with God. Completely one, where there's no you. So you at that moment, it's an affirmation of the first mitzvah, which is God is one, which is there is nothing other than God. But I'm here. No, you're not here. You're just a chariot. But I'm here. No, you're not. You're just a body to a soul. I know you're not here. All you are is all you do is the, the, the faculty of, of, of the power to understand is, is, is nothing other than completely merged and hugging and grasping the wisdom. But what is the wisdom? The wisdom is God's wisdom. That, that's beautiful. It actually explains it very well and answers my question uh, that I had at the beginning, because it also explains why we're so drawn to studying Torah. Right. And right. Why, why, because our godly soul, soul needs that, like a fuel. That, 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 that but, unity. But, but, but what happens to people who don't study Torah? Um, or do, they, do they learn it in, in mother's womb like everybody? You could learn in your mother's womb, but the point is that you're not going to experience, that's the knowledge of what to do. The point is you had that experience in your mother's womb. What's a mother's womb? The, the, the fetus is, doesn't have its own identity. It's completely submerged. It gets energy and nutrients from the mother. It can't be said to be its own identity. It's totally dependent on the mother. So that's why perhaps, I'm just getting poetic here. That's why perhaps in the mother's womb, you study Torah because Torah is that place where you have no, or you're not, you don't have your own identity. But when you come out into the world, you're going to feel yourself. You're in a world which, not by your fault, God created a world. And we say, well, am I an idol worshiper? It's not that I'm an idol worshiper. The energy, anything in this world that's not holy, which God created to have that perspective, is by definition, in some sense, idol worship because it asserts its own existence. And it's true from one perspective. From the perspective of the creation, it's true because we see the tzimtzum as a concealment. So for us, the riddle is a concealment. The reality is the only way to break that separation, the only way to, 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 to merge in the oneness, to truly say God is one and feel God is one and lose one's own, uh, own, own independent identity, the only way to do that is the Torah and the mitzvah. Now, to what degree do I become submerged in the oneness? Again, it depends if I'm studying Torah or doing mitzvah. It also depends what I am, which part of me are you talking about? My body becomes a chariot. My energy of my godly soul becomes like a bot, becomes like a like a limb to the body. I'm sorry, like a limb of the body to this to the energy of the soul, which is two entities, but they come they 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 actually unite. The body is alive. It's not like the body is dead and the soul pumps energy. No, the body become comes comes alive. And then when I study Torah, you can get even deeper, which is my mind. Not the brain, the physical brain is still a chariot, but the mind, the, power, the capacity to think is completely one with the Torah, which is completely one with God. There's nothing else. All it is is God's will. When I have the building, which I built based on God's will, there's also the brick, right? There's also a physical entity, right? You're doing a mitzvah, but the, but the mitzvah itself is what God wants, but it is not God's will. It's not God's will. There's, there's physical material, right? When you talk about an idea, there's no physical material. What physical material here that's separate? My power, to, my brain, my brain's a chariot. The power to think and under, uh, just completely unites with the idea. So in other words, we're looking, why are we studying Torah? So you study Torah to know what to do. Yeah, but so much of Torah is not to know what to do. So much of Torah is, if you want to know what to do, just buy the code of law, right? Why are you thinking about cases that are not practical? Why are you thinking about the back and forth? So much of Torah is not necessarily to know what to do. It is to merge with the, with the will of God. And with the will of God, with the wisdom of God, when I understand it with my mind, that's the deepest level of unity possible. There are other levels of unity. It could be a chariot. Yeah, I'll do a mitzvah, I'll be a chariot. When I do a mitzvah, my body will be like a body to a soul to God. I'm sorry, my soul will be like a body to a soul to God's will. But no other mitzvah will get you that unity that you have through the study of Torah. So again, this, this, is, again, this thing should take, a, we're going very fast, I must confess. We really have to do this slowly and take time. But I think that 
like I said, round one, we try to do a chapter. If we try to do a chapter, a chapter uh, a week, we may run into some problems when we get into the longer chapters in the 30, 30s and 40s, but we'll see. God will help us, hopefully. Okay, now we have the sort of, we're at the end. We're like the, almost done. We have to get to the last idea. It's a big idea. The big idea is that the unit that a person can reach a higher level of awe when he studies Torah, because realizing that you're here in the presence of nothing other than God himself. So let's read that. And that's why, as he's going to explain, it says that Torah study brings you to the awe of God. So the, the unspoken question is, no, if I don't have awe of God, I won't be studying Torah to in the first place. Right? So really, awe of God leads to Torah study, not the other way around. So he's going to say the lower level of awe of God, of awareness of God, motivates you to study Torah. But then when you study Torah, you have access to the higher level of, of, of awe of God. Which, only, which is only possible through Torah, because only through Torah do you have that complete merging with the divine. And, that's, and that awareness brings awe, brings, in, bring, bring, brings an overwhelming feeling of awe, or can be if you're aware of it. Okay, let's go. Let's see if we can, let's, let's see if we can make a, a dash to the end of the chapter. We have four minutes left till the overtime starts, but that's what happens. You know, if you have a good game, you go into overtime and everybody's happy. Okay, now... Since the divine will, which is the perfect unity with God himself, stands completely revealed in the divine soul and its inner garments, i.e. its thought and speech, while a person occupies himself with words of Torah, and there is nothing obscuring the divine will at that time. So when I'm studying Torah, the divine will is completely one with my power to think and speak. It follows that at the time, the soul and these garments of thought, speech, uh, and thoughts and speech are, true, are also truly united with God with unity comparable to that of God's speech and thought with his essence and being as explained above. So just like God's will is united with God, so when I think about God's will, that unity is also includes the unity of my soul. My soul and my capacity to think are also one. In other words, there's nothing concealing here, for nothing is separate from God except insofar as his countenance is concealed. But when I'm studying Torah, God's countenance is not concealed because I don't have my own existence. Okay, now we're going to get to a very interesting point. The unity that I have with God down here in this physical world, when I read a passage of the Torah, is greater than the unity that all the spiritual angels could have in the higher worlds where their awareness of God is much greater. Why? Because where is God's will? God's will is down here. So let's see what he says. Moreover, their unity, meaning of the divine soul, is even more exalted and more powerful than the unity of God's infinite light with the upper spiritual worlds. For the divine will is actually manifest in the soul and its garments that are engaged in Torah study, since it is identical with the Torah being studied. All the supernal worlds receive their vitality by way of the light and life derived from the Torah, which is God's will and wisdom. As it is written, you have made them with wisdom. Thus, it follows that God's wisdom, i.e. the Torah, transcends them all. In other words, everything was created by the divine wisdom. So all the spiritual worlds were created because this is what God wants. But again, what does God really want? What God really wants is the Torah. So the essence of God's will is the Torah. So when we study Torah, we actually have more, a much greater access to God than the part of God which, um, which is expressing itself in the higher worlds. Now we, get, we have a little Kabbalah. He's going to call it encompassing light. In fact, the, Torah's, the Torah, God's will, is described as encompassing all the worlds, meaning that it is at a level that cannot become clothed within the worlds but rather animates and illuminates them as if from a distance from above in a transcending and encompassing manner. And it is this level which transcends all the worlds that is clothed in, the true, in, in, in a truly revealed form in one's soul and his garments when one studies Torah, even though he does not see it. I.e., when he once studies Torah, he is unable to consciously experience the unity of the soul's God, soul, soul with God, which is attained thereby, yet the soul feels it. In fact, this is precisely why we can endure uh, such unity with God, God, with, with God, precisely because he cannot feel it, unlike the supernal worlds. So what we're doing here, I'm sorry, I'm not doing full justice to this, but we're doing, what we're doing here is explaining as follows. We're saying that when I study Torah, I get the essence of God's will, which is not accessible in any of the spiritual worlds, because it's called Soviet Kolam, and the will encompasses the worlds. Without getting into that right now. Then Rabbi Shneur Zaman says, one second, I don't feel that. I'm studying Torah. I feel like I'm united with an idea. What happens if my ox gores your ox? I don't feel like I'm, an, I'm united with the Torah. So, so what if it doesn't matter if you don't feel, but, you're, but, you're so, but first of all, it's true. Second of all, your soul feels it. And then he says, you know why you don't feel? And he says, you know why you can attain that unity? Because you don't feel it. If you would feel it, you wouldn't be able to study. You'd be completely overwhelmed. 
So it goes both ways. Because you don't feel it, that's why you can attain it. If you can attain it, you can't feel it. Because if you can attain it, if, if, I'm sorry, if you, can, if, 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 you attain, if you can attain, you can't feel it. Because if you can feel it, you'll be completely overwhelmed. You wouldn't be able to think straight. Okay, I'm making a rush to the end. And then we'll, we'll um, again, if anybody wants to comment, please do. The discussion of this, of this exalted unity with God. Okay, so this explains why Torah study is so much loftier than all the other commandments, including even prayer, which affects unity within the supernal worlds. Although the law requires anyone whose Torah study is not the entire, his, his entire occupation, that he interrupt his study for prayer, which would seem to indicate that prayer surpasses Torah study, this is only because he would, he would in, in any case, cause and inter, interrupt his studies. So if I'm going to stop, stop studying Torah in five minutes anyway, so I should stop study five minutes earlier to, in order to pray. We're not going to get into that. That's technical. That's halacha. We're not going to get into that. Let's continue. From this explanation of the lofty stature of the Torah study, the wise man will be able to draw upon himself a sense of great awe as he engages in the study of Torah. When he considers how his soul and its garments of thought speech that are found in his brain and mouth are truly fused in perfect unity with the divine will and the infinite light of the Ain Sof that is manifest in them. In other words, when a person thinks and is mindful of the fact that my soul and my power to think and speak are completely fused with the infinite light of God, to a degree, a level of God that even the spiritual worlds cannot contain, that all the upper and lower worlds are truly as naught in comparison with it, and are in fact as absolutely nothing at all, so, mu so much so that they can only bear to have a, mi a minute glow of it clothed in them without their re reverting to nothingness altogether. Their main life force, which they receive from, from it, however, is not clothed within them, but animates them from the outside, so to speak, in a transcendent, encompassing manner. What is Rabbi Shneir Zalman saying? He's saying, um, what is Rabbi Shneir Zalman saying before we, before we dash to the end? Rabbi Shneir Zalman is saying is like this. It's well known, the Kabbalah says that the, there's the encompassing light and the, and the imminent light, the mimale kolami, the, the energy that enters, the, the divine energy that enters and creates every and animates every creation. Then there's the encompassing light. Why do we have both of these models? Because first of all, so we need some internal and in, in, energy internalized. But the energy that the creation can internalize is very minute. We also, but the light, it's not enough to make the person give the person energy. To give the person energy, you have to get life from the from the essence of from the from the infinite light of God. But the infinite light of God is too too much to be felt within this specific creation. The specific creation would be it would explode. It's like too much electricity within a light bulb it would explode. So what's the Kabbalistic method? The Kabbalistic method is that the um, you have encompassing light, it surrounds you, it's not felt within you, and therefore it can create you, but you're not overwhelmed by it. And only a very little bit of light is internalized within you. But the essence of the divine light surrounds you. Says Rabbi Shneir Zan, even in the spiritual worlds, most spiritual worlds, there's only a little ray that's internalized, and the infinite light of God surrounds them. Says Rabbi Shneir Zan, when I study Torah, my soul is one with the infinite light of God, which is a light that even the most spiritual world cannot internalize, it must make encompassing. But when I study the Torah, when I study God's will, I'm one with God's will. What happens? So what should that do? That should create this great, this great awe. This is the meaning of the verse, and God commanded us to fulfill all these statutes in order to fear God, which is a problem because seemingly fear God, or the awe of God gets me to study. Here we're saying, when you study, you're going to get to the awe of God. Regarding this great fear, our sages say, if there is no wisdom, there is no fear. In relation to this level of fear, the Torah is called the gateway to the courtyard, i.e. the sole means of entering the courtyard is the higher level of fear, as is explained elsewhere. So the, the ethics of the Father says, if there's no awe, there's no wisdom. But if there's no wisdom, there's no awe. So we're saying you first need a basic level of awe that would motivate you to study Torah. When you study Torah, you get access to a greater level of awe. What's the greater level of awe? The mindfulness that when I study Torah, I'm connecting with the infinite light of God. I'm one, absolutely one with the infinite light of God, which this infinite light of God is too great even to be experienced by the most sublime worlds. But when I study Torah, I'm absolutely one with that. Not every mind, however, can sustain such a fear. Yet even he whose mind cannot bear such a fear, nor even a minute part of it, because of the root of the source of his of soul, derives from an inferior level, the lower great gradations of the ten spirit, the world of Asiya, even he should not be deterred from the actual performance of Torah and mitzvot for want of this fear, as will be explained further. In other words, yes, uh, studying Torah is a gateway to awe. Even if I don't have the awe, still study Torah, because that's the more important part, as we'll explain. But the bottom line here is 
what we're trying to achieve in this chapter, which I think we did, is the notion that if ever, belief in God, the first mitzvah is the unity of God. Unity of God means not that God is the, is the only God, but God is the only existence. And when I feel that, sorry, when that is true to me, from my perspective, is when I engaged in Torah, in performing a mitzvah or Torah study, and as we define the different gradations. When I perform a mitzvah, my physical body is like a chariot to divine will. My soul, my godly soul, becomes one with God's will the way a body unites with a soul, which the body has no will of its own. It just, you want to move your finger, your finger is going to move. When I study Torah, again, that my physical brain and my physical mouth are chariots. There's something separate that has its own, no, it doesn't have its own identity. My capacity to understand becomes completely one, and not like a body and a soul, but completely one, because there's nothing other than the divine will. So in short, God says, I'm the only existence. That's the first mitzvah. Every mitzvah is a way to connect to that truth. So you can say, what are you talking about? I do a mitzvah, I wrap tefillin, but I feel myself. So if I feel myself, I don't, I'm, not I'm not touching the true meaning of the unity of God, which is God is the only existence and everything else is insignificant. So what's the answer? The answer is no. Maybe you feel that part of you feels that. But when you do the mitzvah, you are a vehicle. You are a vehicle to the divine will. The vehicle can have, is, is really, is really, has no will of its own. It's just a tool. It's just a conduit to the divine will. So in some sense, you're not significant. You're just a vehicle. And the more other parts of my soul are even higher where they're not a vehicle, they're a body to a soul. The unity is much greater. So in short, every time I study Torah, Every time I do a mitzvah, all mitzvahs, any part of Torah, is the affirmation, not only of this specific mitzvah, but it's the affirmation of the first mitzvah. Not only the first mitzvah and the conventional interpretation of the first mitzvah, that yeah, God is God, so I'll listen to what he says, but it's the affirmation of the first mitzvah based on the Hasidic interpretation of the first mitzvah, which is that the unity of God means not only that there's no God, not only there's no other God, but there's no other existence. When I do a mitzvah, I lose my existence, my independent existence, because my existence becomes one with God. To what degree? Either a chariot or like a body to a soul or completely one. So it's true to say when I do a mitzvah, even my body, there's only one thing here. There's only God. Me, I'm, I'm, I'm insignificant. I'm a chariot. Okay, that's an affirmation of the oneness of God. That's how I became a tool to the uh, a vehicle for the oneness of God. So this is the story in short, a little bit, uh, a, lot to, a, lot to, a lot to assimilate, a lot to internalize, but uh, that's the pitch. You can always go back and, and Google chapter 23 and revisit, and, or God willing, we'll revisit in the future again. So, so it's just the beginning. We're just getting our feet wet. So everyone should have a wonderful Shabbos, and next week, hopefully, you continue the journey to chapter 24, God willing, with God's help. Rabbi, one question, yeah. if I 